Okay, well, we're ready to go here for chapter 14, Cognitive Psychology, and this is kind of an important chapter in the context of the rest of the class, at least, because everything that we've been doing so far has kind of been a lead up to uh, modern experimental psychology. That's been kind of one of the goals, right, is to do the history of psychology from the earliest philosophical questions about the nature of mind to get us into the early days of experimental psychology, which we did back in chapters seven and eight uh, and beyond. We were covering the various uh, uh, original schools of thought in psychology beginning in the uh, 19th century. And as we move into now the 20th century, we get to cognitive psychology, which uh, more or less, I think we could still say, uh, is, is still the dominant school of thought or paradigm in psychology. So we've, you know, we've covered uh, the, the early German uh, mentalistic psychology moving into American functionalism and behaviorism. And, um, and, and so in, in the middle of the 20th century, as cognitive psychology began to kind of become the dominant theme as behaviorism was uh, kind of you know, pointed out as having various problems, we'll talk a little bit about this in these notes, um, in the 70-ish uh, years uh, since then, uh, there's, there's really not been uh, anything to come along and replace cognitive psychology, though it's worth mentioning that maybe we might see signs of that happening now. It's, um, there's, there are things out there nowadays that, that uh, certainly reject many of the uh, core aspects of, of at least traditional cognitive psychology. These would be things like uh, what, what are sometimes called 4E cognition or uh, wide cognition. So 4E refers to the four E's of embodied, inactive, embedded, and extended cognition. Uh, sometimes people like to throw in the fifth E of ecological psychology, which is the topic that we covered back in chapter 10. And it does have th some things that, that make it compatible with inactive, embodied, extended, and embedded cognition. So we're not going to get into those. Those are more of the modern, maybe future uh, of psychology, but uh, that's just the context of where we are now. But let's take a look at what cognitive psychology is all about and how that kind of became the dominant theme here. So let's talk first about the, <clears throat> the, the kind of foundational parts of cognitive psychology, the context of where it came from. It's very popular to look at cognitive psychology, which kind of became a thing in the 1950s. That's kind of our decade that we want to think about here. You know, give or take. Um, a lot of historians, psychology historians, like to refer to this decade as the era of the cognitive revolution. It's an interesting term, and it kind of gives off this impression that uh, cognitive psychologists are storming the psychology buildings and kicking out the behaviorists, right? Um, having a scientific revolution, which is actually a real idea. So there's a, another philosopher of science. We've previously talked about philosophy of science from the positivist and logical positivist uh, approaches uh, and people like Karl Popper. But Thomas Kuhn is another famous um, 20th century philosopher of science, and, and he wrote about science from the perspective of a uh, of something like a sociologist, uh, recognizing that science is a human endeavor, a social endeavor, and that humans, when doing science, bring to it uh, our own biases and perspectives, and it's not the pure empiricist uh, enterprise that the positivist uh, theories would would sometimes describe it. And so what Kuhn described when, when, ta when he talks about humans doing science, people doing science, is that there is frequently what you would call a dominant paradigm. The dominant paradigm represents kind of the overarching theory that kind of governs uh, the, the, the science as, as it's done. And during a dominant paradigm, 
he calls this normal science. And he says that during normal science, what constitutes normal science is that science proceeds in baby steps, right? So think about that. The idea is that you have a dominant overarching theme, theory, paradigm for, for that, that kind of describes the kind of science that, that people are doing. And each uh, new study, new experiment, new publication that comes out dozens every month, right? Um, is just one small piece of a much larger puzzle that helps fill in the gaps of this paradigm, right? So that's what we mean by baby steps, is that each new study, each new publication, is just one small piece of information that advances the current paradigm. It's not as if every new paper is some revolutionary, important, world-shattering discovery, right? That's the idea. But of course, every now and then we do have these groundbreaking discoveries, right? Things that revolutionize the science. And so these are called, in Kuhn's uh, uh, idea here, paradigm shifts. Whereas we also don't call them scientific revolutions in a more kind of co common everyday language, but using the language that Kuhn used in his work, he talks about paradigms and paradigm shifts. A couple of cl classic examples here, uh, on Einstein. Einstein's work in physics represents a classic paradigm shift. So the idea is that prior to Einstein's uh, uh, work related to both quantum theory as well as uh, uh, general relativity theory and special relativity theory, Newtonian mechanics was the dominant paradigm in physics. But there were certain aspects about uh, what, pe what people were discovering about, uh, especially about um, uh, electrons and light and photons in their behavior that didn't seem to fit neatly within Newton's theories in physics. And there were various paradoxes and contradictions that people couldn't quite work out. And without getting into the details of Einstein's physics, we, we can just simply realize that, that there were things that, that he came up with that are part of quantum theory that, that uh, were very new, were completely different, that, that uh, that solve these paradoxes that otherwise could not be solved by Newtonian mechanics and, and therefore created something that was an entirely new physics. And of course, we see 20th century physics being uh, a scientific revolution, right? All of the discoveries and work that came out of um, all of the quantum research as well as uh, the research in, in relativity theory. Another classic one that I didn't put on the slide is Pasteur. So, Prior to Louis Pasteur doing research uh, to discover yeast and other microorganisms that cause spoilage in food, and then extending that to the idea of spreading communicable disease through microorganisms like bacteria and viruses, which Pasteur didn't do all of that, but the idea is that that kind of stuff about the understanding that microorganisms exist and they cause illness, whether it's food spoilage and, and foodborne illness, or whether it's communicable diseases of other types, that was a revolution because before Pasteur's initial discovery, no one knew that. We didn't know that these, these microorganisms existed. And so people didn't know what caused illness. And, and there were other ideas, so-called bad air or miasma. And uh, so the idea, and this is a crucial part of what constitutes a paradigm shift, in Kuhn's, Kuhn's theory, and this is the reason we're talking about it right now, is that with Pasteur being a good example, once Pasteur discovered microorganisms are the source of illness, it no longer becomes valid to even talk about bad air, right? We just say, okay, bad air is not a thing. That's not real. We know that that's wrong. It's an older, uh, naive uh, understanding of illness that we're going to replace with microorganisms. And so that's a paradigm shift. And the reason it, we want to think of it as a paradigm shift is that following this discovery, biologists and medical researchers who are looking into these issues are no longer allowed to talk about bad air, right? If someone publishes a paper to talk about bad air, the, 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 the other researchers are going to, even the peer review process is going to look at that and they're going to say, you know what? time to stop, you know, you can't do this, right? We've already shown that this doesn't, you know, this is no longer the accepted idea. So the nature of the, the social aspect of peer review basically puts constraints on the nature of what is, can be even published and the research that's done. And so of course, then over time, 
the researchers now all begin working within the new paradigm, the new paradigm being microorganisms, right? Just like with physics, um, trying to apply Newtonian theory to the behavior of photons and electrons no longer is acceptable. And, and, research, and physicists begin to understand, okay, we have to use these new ideas to describe how photons work, right? And what they do in subatomic particles of various types. We have to use these new theories, not Newton's theories. So when we look at this and we think, all right, is this language appropriate to describe what happened in the middle of the 20th century when cognitive psychology took over for behaviorism? Did we have things that were completely brand new, revolutionary ideas that had never been used before to explain behavior? And now that we have these brand new ideas, we have to throw away the old ideas. And there's some concern about that. So even though it is very popular to, to just call this the cognitive revolution and consider it to be a paradigm shift within psychology, um, there are some aspects of it that don't quite meet Kuhn's definition of a true paradigm shift. One of the things that we might consider, for example, is with the behavioristic ideas of classical conditioning and um, uh, operant conditioning, Skinner's work, uh, considered to be uh, incorrect. And the answer to that is no, right? So, so even though we might think that, well, you know, there, there might we might decide that there are limits to how much can be explained by appealing to classical and operant conditioning. We can't explain all behavior, which is what the behaviorist wanted to do, was to explain literally all behavior using those two kinds of learning approaches. We wouldn't look at the basic behaviors and say, those cannot be explained by classical or operant conditioning, right? So we didn't disprove those theories. They still exist. We still accept the fact that that uh, condition reflexes exist and that reinforcement and punishment exist and those are things that shape and, and affect behavior. The other thing that we need to consider is what were the actual ideas that cognitive psychologists were now popularizing in the 1950s and 60s? And were these brand new ideas that had not been known before, right? Brand new discoveries that we hadn't uh, talked about ever before. And what we can think about here is that if we think of some of the things that represent cognitive psychology, these are not new at all. In fact, we have talked already in this class and talking about these many old historical ideas, things that relate to modern cognitive psychology. If you remember Avicenna back in chapter three, uh, he's talking about uh, ideas that relate to, that, that were very similar. I, I mentioned this in chapter three, that his, his theory of cognition that talks about sensory memory or the, the common sense, right? And the various uh, imaginations that he says we have, the compositive imagination and things like that. These are ideas that align somewhat roughly to idea, modern ideas of sensory memory and short-term memory and long-term memory, working memory and things like that. Uh, even Locke's theory of ideas was a cognitive theory of sorts. It described learning by association, but it also described the presence of, of simple and complex ideas and categories. And so categorization is a big part of modern cognitive psychology, how we create and learn mental cognitive categories. Of course, Kant introduced the idea of top-down processing, which was also taken up by uh, people like Helmholtz in the 19th century. Wundt was doing cognitive psychology. His attempts to study mental chronometry, he was studying stages of mental processing, right? There was the reaction stage and the, in the perceptual stage and the, and the response selection stage. One thing we should also recognize is that behaviorism as a dominant paradigm in psychology, if you want to call it that even, was very much an American-centric approach. There were, in, in Europe, uh, there were other 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 paradigms where behaviorism really didn't take over to the extent to the strength that it did in the United States. So you have, for example, the famous Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky, uh, who is writing about the importance of the development of cognition in children. So it's cognitive psychology, but this is in the 1920s in Russia, and uh, 19 teens and 20s, and and um, 
and he's and he's writing about language, especially in the importance of how children learn language in a social context and how the social linguistic aspects of that development then shape their cognition as the and their reasoning skills as they as they mature. Likewise, in the 1920s. Uh, Bartlett in England gives us the whole concept of a schema. And so if you've had a psychology class, you would have learned about schemas, I would hope. Schemas represent these ways in which we organize our knowledge about the world. And I didn't even list him here, but, but uh, Jean Piaget in, 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 uh, in Switzerland uh, also extends Bartlett's concept of schemas to talk about children's cognitive development. So like Vygotsky, we have another th theory of children's cognitive development in this case, influenced by the idea of schemas, that children uh, develop their naive schemas about how the world works, and then they set about refining and improving those schemas through, through experience, through testing them in the world. But let's actually talk about some of the things that we think of as being uh, big parts of the, the so-called cognitive revolution. Um, Got four things here. I could probably write a whole lot of, on this, and maybe some are a little more important than others. But, but these are at least a couple of things that are kind of important. I think the first two, Carl Lashley's paper, and then uh, Noam Chomsky's paper. That's who's pictured here on the slide. It's Noam Chomsky. Um, these two two were, wrote papers from two different perspectives, but they ended up both kind of serving a similar function in the history of psychology, which is that they both were were you kind of used to f f identify problems with behaviorism, what we might think of as intractable problems or fatal problems for behaviorism. So basically, ideas that show, look. Behaviorism is not going to work to explain certain complex behaviors. That's been a debate going back in chapter uh, 12 when we talked about um, Romaine's and uh, Morgan and Morgan's canon about the scale of, of, of uh, psychological complexity. And the behaviorists essentially want to keep everything down to the bottom of the scale, right? Everything should be explained by some sort of simple, reflexive, mindless. Uh, be, uh, explanation with no quote unquote psychological complexity involved. We saw the functionalist from earlier, people like uh, 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 Herbert Jennings Spencer, Herbert uh, Spencer Jennings, sorry, uh, uh, debating Jacques Loeb and saying, no, you know, whenever certain complex behaviors are involved, we have to climb the scale of Morgan's canon, right? Um, and so what we see with Lashley and Chomsky is an argument that we need to start climbing the scale again. We cannot stay at the bottom and talk only about simple reflexive type things, which is what classical and operant conditioning do. So let's talk about Carl Lashley, who in fact was trained as a behaviorist. So he's writing from the perspective as a behaviorist first and foremost. But what he's noting is that, that there are a lot of times when, when behaviors attempt to tackle complexity in behavior, they face difficulty in explaining it. And this is what he calls the problem of serial order. So that's the title of his paper, right? Serial order means doing things in series or in a sequence. So you do things, you, do, you got step one, step two, step three, step four, right? You're, you're doing a series of things in order. So one of the classic examples of that is language. And that is maybe not obvious, but Think about how reductionist behaviorists are, right? They try to simplify behavior down into a sequence of things. So Skinner, for example, would say that things that we think of as complex behaviors are in fact really just simple behaviors, but it's a series of simple behaviors that have been chained together in a series or a sequence. And so that would be his way of explaining language. He would say language is really, it seems like a very complex thing to put all these words together in a long statement to convey all of this abstract meaning, right? That seems complex, but Skinner says we can explain it in simpler terms, but what we need to do is we need to figure out what are the units of language. And so the argument in this time frame was that the basic units of language were things called phonemes. And phonemes are the units of sound in a language. So if I use the, 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 the phrase uh, cat, for example, the word cat, for example, right? I'm going to say that we have um, the sound ka and the sound a and the sound ta, 
and we get the, um, the, the word cat from that. And so it's a chaining together of three sounds, and, but then all of language is like that. And so Skinner says it's basically stimulus and response, that every phoneme is a stimulus for the phoneme to follow as a response, which in turn becomes a stimulus for the next. One of the things that you have to be able to account for in this theory is the idea of a um, speech error, right? Sometimes we make speech errors. Can, how can we explain speech errors? So a behaviorist would say is that, well, sometimes you insert the wrong response. You have a stimulus, but sometimes the wrong response occurs. And so you end up saying bat instead of cat because you end up with the wrong phoneme in there somewhere, right? But the problem is that Lashley was aware of saw this, this man. His name was the, uh, William Archibald Spooner. And Spooner was famous for these very strange and unusual speech errors that came to be known after him called Spoonerisms. And Spoonerisms are unusual speech errors because they're not just random phonemes inserted into a statement. So instead of saying, I want to pet the cat and I say I want to pet the bat as if there's just one random phoneme stuck into my sentence and I could say oh that was just an accident pure random accident that's the, that would be Skinner's explanation for it. Spooner would say things like um, you have hissed all of my mystery lectures. He's trying to say you have missed all of my history lectures but instead he's taking the uh, ha sound at the beginning of history and he's using it too early in the sentence, placing it at the beginning of the word missed. So he ends up saying hissed instead of missed. And then that M that gets taken out at the beginning of missed gets held and reinserted into the sentence later on when, when instead of saying history, he says mystery. So instead of saying you have missed all of my history lectures, he says you have hissed all of my mystery lectures. And he has all of these, he's got dozens and dozens of the examples of this of students of his having uh, cited the, these, these kind of, in some cases, humorous speech errors. Um, and Lashley points out that this kind of, 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 of uh, speech error cannot be explained simply by just randomly inserting a, a, a phoneme into the middle of a sentence, right? It actually entails the possibility and the probability that in Spooner's brain, there must be some sort of speech sequencer, something that's planning the sequence of phonemes in advance, and that in trying to get them all in the right order, it swaps things around for some reason. Wait, why is Spooner's brain like that? We don't know. Well, I think we have some uh, neuroscience data on the understanding of why that might be happening, but the, but the basic idea, though, is at a theoretical level, it proves the existence of a speech sequencer that, in the case of Spooner, is malfunctioning. But the fact that speech could be serially ordered and planned in advance by some mechanism in the brain before it is in fact performed is, is suggests the idea of an internal cognitive process that happens in the planning and organization of language before we actually speak the language. But of course, if you're a behaviorist, language is just the behavior. It is just the speaking. So Lashley's point here about spoonerisms and speech errors points to the idea that there's a cognitive process that has to be at work kind of behind the scenes to explain how language works, and to explain these speech errors. So, so that's a problem for behaviorism, right? He also points out that language is very fast. And so the idea is that if, you have, if you're talking about stimulus response behaviors here, that every phoneme is a stimulus and it has a response, that in terms of stimulus response behaviors, there's always got to be a reaction time. We know this from, from Wundt's research, for example, that there's only so fast that people can respond to a stimulus, right? Helmholtz also did reaction time studies. So we've known about reaction time studies for a long time at this point. And um, again, if, if we think about what's the fastest human reaction time, it's usually on the order of about a tenth of a second, maybe even a little bit longer than that. A tenth of a second is 100 milliseconds, right? That would entail, for example, the likelihood that between every phoneme, there has to be at least a 10 millisecond delay so that I can detect the first stimulus and then respond to it. But that wouldn't sound like the word cat. If I actually produce, produce the phonemes k, at, and t with a, 10 a ten, tenth of a second delay in between them, it would sound more like k, t, right? Did you catch that? K, t, 
that doesn't sound like the word cat at all, right? So that's not what we're doing when we're producing sound. We're not producing phonemes with, with delays in between them as if each one is part of a serial sequence and that requires a re reaction time between them. Instead, it's, it's almost as if we, we're doing what's called co-articulating. We're blending the phonemes together as if, again, we have planned them in advance and sent the sequence to the speech articulators after having planned it somewhere in the brain. And then the speech articulators co-articulate the plan. In, uh, the, the mention here of playing a musical instrument is based on the same idea that, again, if you're playing some kind of piano piece or a saxophone or whatever, you've got a series of notes that have to be played in order, right? And sometimes, though, we have to do it very fast, right? Depending on the nature of the music, you might not have a very busy piece and you've got to play a lot of notes in a short amount of time and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of complexity there. And again, if you're following the behaviorist approach, it's stimulus followed by response. Each note is the stimulus for the next. But if you are pointing out here that, uh, like Lashley, Sometimes these, these notes occur so close together in time that you cannot consider them to be a series of stimulus and response. It's planned, it's all learned and planned in advance by some organizing sequencer in the brain. And then it's those commands are then sent to the fingers to play the notes. Chomsky, a few years later, ex extends on the basic idea by directly critiquing Skinner, because Skinner had actually written a book called Verbal Behavior, where he's trying to take this behaviorist approach to explaining language. He calls it verbal behavior instead of calling it speech, right? Because he's focusing more on the behavior side. And Chomsky basically tears it apart. And he, and, and he uh, says that the only way to explain language, and here he's focusing a lot on things like grammar, and that gra grammar is a very complex set of rules that we learn as young as two and three years old to begin producing fluent language. And his argument is that children have not been exposed to sufficient amount of information to, to account for their abilities, that, that children at this young of an age start producing fairly sophisticated language. Um, and his argument is that the only way to explain that is to say that they must have something internal, some kind of innate knowledge something built into the brain, and he calls it a language acquisition device. He says that it's built into the brain, and that's where grammar comes from. There's no possible way for us to learn grammar just by listening to language and in three years start producing kind of speech that three-year-old human children are capable of. His argument, there's more going on here. So he's taking this very top-down, kind of nativist, uh, cognitive kind of approach. Something else that's worth mentioning here, uh, George Miller. So, so the, if you've, you've heard of magic, magic number seven, right? This is the idea that our short-term memory is limited to seven plus or minus two items. This is based off of George Miller's paper. It came out in 1957. And, and what he's doing here is he's just reviewing a few decades of memory studies, going back to Ebbinghaus, if you remember Ebbinghaus back in chapter eight. Um, and he notes that in all these studies, the number seven just keeps popping up over and over again. And it seems to suggest that there is some sort of capacity limit to short-term memory. And, and you know, that capacity limit falls somewhere in the ballpark of seven. What's important about this is just the idea that, again, there's this cognitive system. And even though we can't see it, and again, that's the kind of thing behaviors make a big deal about, is talking about things we don't can't, you know, see as being not scientific. But Miller's suggesting here that there is enough replication of this kind of finding occurring that we can start to take it seriously that yes, there is some kind of, he called it temporary memory at this, at this time instead of short-term memory. But his, his argument is that there's enough evidence in the literature to believe that there is really some kind of temporary memory system and it has properties that can be measured. And, and therefore it's valid scientifically to even talk about temporary, temporary memory, even if we haven't literally put our eyes on it, right? Now there is this last point, and it's pretty important. So if there's anything that we might consider be, to be the, the, here we have the tr quote unquote true revolutionary component, it's computers. Because digital computing, as we know, it was essentially an invention of the 1940s, people like Alan Turing, and we get new ideas from that. Ideas that did not exist before, concepts of information theory. So Claude Shannon wrote a paper on information theory in the 1940s, and he defines concepts like bits. Well, what's a bit? 
a bit is a, is a, is a contraction of, a word, of the phrase binary digit, but it's a way of measuring information and quantifying information in terms of these uh, binary digits or bits. And then we can even think about how much time it takes to process a certain amount of bits. And that's called bandwidth. So we can talk about how many bits per second can be processed or transmitted by a given signal. And that's all part of information theory. And when we talk about information theory, we also use the phrase cybernetics. Is the, cybernetics is the study of information processing systems. And from that, we get other things like biological, cybernet, biological cybernetics, which is biological information processing systems. What is that? The brain, for example. We might think of the brain now as a digital computer, contrary to the gestaltist, if we remember back in chapter nine, if the brain becomes a digital computer and it processes information and you know, maybe it stores information in terms of bits, i.e. Miller's magic number seven, which is why I brought this up, um, then okay, maybe, maybe we can start talking about that, that, the inf that the, maybe the brain is, a, is an information storage device of some sort. It's like a hard drive on a computer. And we can talk about its different memory bins or buffers. In fact, that becomes a popular thing to do in cognitive psychology is to talk about temporary memory as a buffer. And if you've had any kind of computer science class, you might've learned about temporary mem memory systems in computers are called buffers. And so this is the idea is that once we start applying information theory and cybernetic principles to, to, to human psychology, this is, the big theme. So this part, in fact, we could say this is revolutionary in a way, is that what this does is it gives us a bunch of new ideas. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can only talk about the, the mind and brain as, um, as a computer, right? So certainly that's not the case. So it's not maybe a true paradigm shift, but at least it is something that is brand new to the point that it gives us lots of new inspirations and new ideas about how we might be able to think about minds and brains. And therefore, new research can be done. And that's, of course, exactly what happens is that everyone gets inspired by this and throughout the 1950s and 60s and 70s and beyond until today, lots and lots of research gets done on using this, this kind of uh, metaphor of the brain as a computer, as a digital computer. I should also mention when speaking on the concept of the so-called cognitive revolution is that uh, Behaviorists, you know, I, I had kind of made the joke at the beginning about how it gives us the idea that the cognitive psychologists kind of overrun the psych departments and, and throw out the behaviorist. And of course, that's literally not true, right? That's not how academia works. So the behaviorist stuck around they're arguing with the cognitive psychologist for a decade. But, you know, uh, Skinner, for example, continued his position at Harvard until I think around 1988 or 1999, and then he passed away in 1990. So, so all through the, the, the heyday of, of cognitive psychology in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we, you know, Skinner is still there at Harvard uh, arguing back the whole time. So, so it really just was, a take, it took a few decades for the behaviorists to essentially retire out and leave academia, that, that kind of leaving it to the cognitive psychologists, that it was a, more of a generational change uh, more so than any kind of a sudden, sudden, you know, change that occurred within the span of a decade, like the 1950s. So let's talk a little bit more about cybernetics here. IP, short for information processing, right? Um, and and so Donald Broadbent, pictured here, uh, was a big name in this idea. He says that computers work in an input-output kind of a way, right? And, but just like we think about with behaviorism as input output in the form of stimulus and response, remember that the behaviorists don't like to put anything between the stimulus and the response, except maybe a few intervening variables if they're really pressed, like as the way Clark Hull did it. But we don't like to talk, put the mind in there, right? Because that was the old functionalist SOR chain. And that's what the behaviorists tried to get rid of entirely. And we're seeing it returning here, we're just with new words, right? So instead of saying SOR, now we've got input, something, output. What's the something? Well, just like a computer has a processor, we're gonna say that the brain is gonna be something like a processor, but Broadbent calls it a black box because that's, a, that's something that means that there's something happening inside of it, but we can't see inside of it, right? So a black box means that there's a b box that's opaque, you can't really see what's going on inside of it, 
But just because we can't see what's going on inside of it doesn't mean there's nothing happening inside of it, right? So just like a computer has a processor, and we really can't see what's going on inside the processor in terms of the computational processes, the electronic processes, right? We know that they're happening. And one of the ways we at least know that they're happening is because we've programmed it that way. But of course, on the other side is that we can compare the difference between input and output. And once we understand that, we can say, oh, yeah, yeah we, can, we can infer the kinds of computational processes that are happening inside the black box because we know the difference between the input and the output. So if we replace the input with, with stimulus and the output with response, we might be able to draw some inferences about what's happening inside the human black box, aka our brains. Right? Another example of cybernetics here is uh, control theory. So control theory is, is a term that we might use more often in, in robotic systems um, to talk about things like uh, feedback and feed forward control of a robotic arm, right? So you wanna be able to program a robotic arm to, to perform some task, right? Whether it's a manufacturing task or something like that. But the robotic arm needs to be able to account for, uh, so sometimes robotic arms can be completely pre-programmed to just do whatever you tell them to do in advance. So you want to say, I want this robotic arm to move to, from here to here. And so you program into the computer that controls this robot uh, a series of commands that cause the robotics joint to do exactly what you tell it to do. That's called feed forward control because the commands are fed forward from the computer to the robotic arm and it just does exactly what it's been told to do. But sometimes, you, if you want to build a slightly more robust robot, and by, by robust, I mean one that can handle changing conditions, um, it needs to be able to account for unexpected perturbation. So if you tell the robot to move a certain way, but there's some external disturbance that affects its, its movement, uh, if it can't correct for that, it's going to end up wrong. So think now, if you've seen these videos that are kind of popular online by a company called Boston Dynamics, um, they uh, build these robots that can walk around and climb stairs, but they're also able to deal with perturbations. If you, they show these robots where they like kicking them and pushing them around and that robot kind of stumbles, but is able to actually stay upright and not fall over. The reason they're doing that is because they want to test the ability of these robots to be robust. That is, they're not just executing a series of planned commands that have been sent to the robotic legs, but they, they actually have an active balance control system. And that means that not only are they trying to do what they've been programmed to do, but they also are accounting for unexpected inputs, unexpected perturbations. And that's called feedback processing, detecting errors in their movements and then correcting those errors. And, and so we can do that to build good robots, but of course we might also then start to say, is this also how the human brain works too? Is that what's going on with human brains? Is that, is that we control our bodies through some kind of combination of feed forward and feedback control mechanisms? And we can understand then maybe what's going on in motor parts of the brain by trying to understand some aspect of, of how feedback mechanisms actually work. And we can use that to engineer the brain, kind of reverse engineer what the brain is doing perhaps, right? Another idea is uh, called connectionism or, or distributed parallel connections uh, or distributed parallel processing. Uh, the idea is that uh, just like a, an internet network is really a series of computers and information is stored kind of like in the cloud, right? Distributed across many different machines and many different servers. Um, we might say that something similar is happening in the brain. And this was a, another thing that behaviorists were trying to do was, shit, was trying to figure out, this is actually what Carl Lashley spent a lot of his career trying to do, which was to find something he called the ingram, which is the location of a memory in the brain, as if maybe it was stored in a very specific um, neuron or, or a synapse. And by damaging different parts of the brain, he, was, he would like to teach uh, rats or frogs how to do some behavior. And then he would lesion some part of their brain and see if he makes, makes this learned behavior go away. And he would try it in one part of the brain. If that didn't work, he would damage another part of the brain. Or if that didn't work, he would damage another part of the brain. And he kept on going and, and he's trying all these different lesion ideas. None of them ever worked. And, and so he was kind of, you know, confounded by this. And, uh, but the connectionist idea is that that kind of project would be doomed to failure because information is not stored specifically in any one place in any part of the network, right? It's, it's stored across the entire network, right? 
information is only stored as, as, as connections between nodes in a network. So I have I, some pictures here. We really don't need to get too overly worried about wh what's going on here, but these are computational uh, neural networks. So this is how machine learning works, right? Deep learning, all this kind of stuff that we're doing nowadays, where you have input layers and output layers, but in between them, so think again, you have the black box, you have hidden layers, right? Things where the information is being processed and represented across many different interconnected nodes. If we think of these as neurons, we can kind of get a sense of the complexity of what's happening in the brain, right? Each node perhaps could be a neuron, but the information is not stored anywhere in any single neuron, nor is it stored in any synapse, which might be what each of these of the in lines interconnecting the neurons refers to here. There's all this complexity, right? Think of how many different connections there are here, just in these simple diagrams, these simple neural network structures. And then we think of the fact that we have billions and hundreds of billions of neurons in the brain, how many actual interconnections there are, which gets into the trillions, if not higher, uncountable levels of numbers here. And uh, of course, they're not all the same kinds of connections. I've listed here that neural connections can be either excitatory or inhibitory. That's even an oversimplification. Some are, are, are metabotropic. That is, they don't have either excitatory or inhibitory effects as much as they just alter neuron metabolism. So, the, the, the total degree of computational complexity in the brain, if that's why, the way you want to think about all of this interconnectedness, uh, gets to be uh, mind-bogglingly high, right? So we might think of the brain as some sort of a massive uh, supercomputer of sorts that can, comp that can work at this kind of computational level with all of this information stored across distributed neural networks. I want to conclude this chapter on, on cognitive psychology by talking about one very concrete example of, of information theory and the success that it's had in being able to explain behavior. And so we want to first start by going back to the word bits that I talked about before, which is a contraction of the term binary digit, and it's a way of counting information and measuring information. But I want to talk about how it actually does that. So the symbol for bits is, this, is the letter H. And we can talk about the idea that, that a bit is a unit of information, or we could talk about it as a unit of uncertainty. So what do I mean by that? So let's say you're faced with a, a situation where you're not sure of the outcome. And that's of course a future state, right? Something is going to happen in the future, but you have uncertainty about what will happen. So that means the reason you have uncertainty is because you lack information. And so, of course, once you observe the outcome, so now the event has occurred and you have observed it, so now it's in the past, you have removed uncertainty, right? And by doing, to, but in order to remove uncertainty, that means you must have gained information. How much information have you gained? That's the question. That's how we want to measure bits. Well, we could think of the fact that you, the, the amount of information that you have gained has something to do with how much uncertainty you previously had, right? More uncertainty means you, have, you need more information to resolve that uncertainty, right? Kind of, kind of an intuitive idea. More uncertainty means you need more information to resolve that uncertainty. So let's consider a simple situation. We're gonna flip a coin. You toss the coin into the air, it hasn't yet landed, so this is a future event, you, and you have some uncertainty. How much uncertainty? Well, how much uncertainty depends on how many out possible outcomes there are. So in this case, with flipping a coin, there's really only two possible outcomes, right? There's just heads and tails. So you observe that it lands heads, you have resolved your uncertainty by gaining information. How much information have you gained? Well, there's a formula right here. H, how many bits of information have you gained, is defined as the base two logarithm of N. And N is how many possible outcomes there were, how much uncertainty there was in this task. Well, there was two. You can check this with a calculator if you want, but if you calculate the base two logarithm of two, where n, where n equals two, 
it will tell you that the answer is one. You have gained one bit of information. So you can imagine that that's the simplest case, right? When let's let's go to the let's go to another case here. Let's go down. Let's let's say that the coin is a cheat. It's heads on both sides, and you know it's got heads on both sides. So when you flip the coin, we could ask how much uncertainty do you have about whether it will land heads or tails? Well, it's not going to land tails, right? You have no uncertainty. You know it's going to land heads. So there's only one possible outcome, and you know that, right? So when it lands heads, how much information have you gained? None, right? There was no uncertainty, so you're not learning anything. And you can check this with a calculator. If there's only, if n equals one, the base two logarithm of one is zero. You've gained zero bits of information when there's only one possible outcome because there's no uncertainty. But when we go up to two possible outcomes, there's a little bit more uncertainty. So now we would say that that equates to one bit of information. And likewise, if there were three possible outcomes, I don't know what the base two logarithm of three is, but check it on a calculator if you want, and you will find out how many bits of information you would be gained in that case. If you're rolling dice, you know, a single die has six sides, right? So base two logarithm of six, whatever that is, is a way of calculating how much information you've gained by observing whether you roll one through six. So that's what bits are. But now, and so, you know, we could talk about, you know, Miller's magic number seven, perhaps in terms of bits, I got that noted here at the bottom, but let's think also about bandwidth. So the other thing that we need to do with information besides store is we need to transmit it. So just like your internet connection at home, for example, has a bandwidth that represents how many bits can be transmitted between your computer and some server on the internet, how many bits per second, and that determines your upload and download speeds, right? We might also think that in the human brain, there might be bandwidth issues because another thing that's very popular and in, in, in what uh, cognitive psychology likes to consider is a modularized approach to function in the brain. We know we've got visual processing centers in the brain and we've got motor processing centers in the brain. So if I see something and want to pick it up, the idea is that the visual system has to do its job and then send some information to the motor system so it can do its job of reaching out to pick up an object. And that means that visual information needs to be transmitted to the motor system. And if the visual information is, has a certain number of bits associated with it, because there's some difficulty or, or, or uncertainty associated with, with, the, um, with the information load of, of what you're seeing, then that determines uh, how much time it takes to send that information to the motor parts of the brain. At least that would be the assumption if we argue that whatever transmission occurs between the visual part of the brain and the motor part of the brain has a limited bandwidth. So just like your internet connection has a limited bandwidth, and if you want to download a really big file from the internet, it takes longer than if you're downloading a small file, right? The reason it takes longer is because that this, your internet connection can only handle so many bits per second. And if there's billions and billions of bits that you're downloading, it's going to take a few minutes. But if there's only a couple thousand bits, and it takes a few seconds to download it, right? Can we take this same analogy and apply it to the brain? Well, this is where we get one of our few laws in psychology. It's called Fitz Law, named for Paul Fitz, who discovered it. And that's his claim, is that the visual motor system in the brain has a limited bandwidth for transmitting information between these two systems and for then visually controlling a movement. So Fitz his starts with the main assumption that we need to think about how do we measure uncertainty when it comes to visual information? What do we mean uncertainty when, with visual information? Well, he says that it's really what we would consider task difficulty. What are we talking about here? Think about this. You've heard of something called a speed accuracy trade-off maybe. If you know that you're doing something that's very difficult, or that has high accuracy requirements, you do it slowly, you move carefully and slowly, right? But if it's easy, you can do it quickly, right? So imagine, for example, you're just pressing a button. If it's a tiny little button, you have to kind of go slow or it increases your chance of missing it and being inaccurate. But if it's a great big giant button, then you don't have to go so slow. You can go really fast, you're still gonna be accurate because it's easy, right? So that's what Fitz is really thinking about here, is he's thinking, okay, there are factors that can make a movement more difficult to perform, 
And those are therefore the things that increase the, the information associated with the task. Because information is related to uncertainty, then the idea is that that's, that's the issue here, is that small targets and large targets will uh, increase our uncertainty about maybe where the target is, and where is our finger in relation to the target as we approach it. Therefore, anything that increases the task difficulty, uh, if we assume that there's a fixed limited bandwidth capacity to the system, anything that increases the task difficulty is gonna cause us to have to move slower. And that's how we would explain the speed accuracy trade-off. That seems to be a well-known phenomenon in human movement. So if we go back to our equation, h equals to the base two logarithm of n, n seems to be the crucial issue here. We need to figure out what can we use uh, to substitute in for n in this equation to measure the, the difficulty level of a, of a movement task. And so Fitz says we need an index of difficulty. That is just some variable, we're gonna call it id for short, that measures the difficulty of a simple pointing task like I just described, just moving your hand to point and, and uh, push a button. So there's Paul Fitz. In the early 50s, you see right at the, in the midst of this whole cognitive revolution, Fitz is doing this research, right? He says that there are two variables that tend to increase the difficulty of a pointing task because they make pointing tasks take longer a longer amplitude movement. That means longer distance between where your hand is at the start and where the target is, how far you have to go with your hand, right? He calls that a long amplitude movement, but if your hand is very close to the target, it's a smaller amplitude. And then of course the size of the target itself, right? Very tiny targets make it more difficult. So we're gonna use these variables, A for amplitude and W for target width is what he called it, um, as the index of difficulty. So we're now we're going to take the base two logarithm, not of the index of difficulty, but A over W as a uh, ratio here. It has to be a ratio if you think about it, because as amplitude increases, movements take longer, right? That's the longer the distance is, the longer it takes to do it. But as the target sizes get smaller, the movement takes longer, right? So there's this inverse relationship between the size of the target and the time, time it takes to complete your movement. So it has to actually be in the denominator here. And what Fitz discovered here is not just that we're going to plug the, the A over W ratio into the formula for calculating bits, but it's actually gonna be part of this linear equation that I have here to predict movement time. That's what MT stands for. Movement time is the time it takes for you to actually complete your movement. So you got your hand in one position, you see a target, you're gonna go point and target, push the button, whatever it is. And it's gonna take a certain amount of time to perform that. And Fitz is basically saying, what I want you to do in this task is I want you to touch the target as fast as you can, but still be accurate. And with an instruction like that, what he's ensuring is that you're, 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 you're pushing yourself to your limits. You're, you're pushing yourself to the edge of your bandwidth limits, right? To process as much information you can as fast as you can. And you get this linear equation, right? So if you remember your basics of straight lines, right? So Y equals A plus B times X. And so B would be the slope of the line. You use X to predict Y, right? B would be the slope and A would be the intercept. That's what you have here, except instead of X, we have this index of difficulty, the base two logarithm of A over W. And then for Y, what we're using that to predict is the time it takes to complete the movement, movement time or MT. Here's a picture of the task. So we can see here, Fitz had people perform. He's got this, they're holding a stylus, which is this little electrified pen that, uh, when you tap down on these targets where these little hash lines are, these are actually copper plates that close a circuit. So these got a timer that can record the time between taps on the, on the targets. And the person is, is, is supposed to just go back and forth between the two targets as fast as they can. So again, be as, go as fast as you can, but still ensure that you're hitting the target. And he's recording the time it takes between uh, target hits. And he can manipulate two things here. He can manipulate the amplitude, which is the distance between the targets, right? How far you have to travel between, with, you know, between the targets. And then these little uh, things on the side of the target, these are sliding occluders. So he can make the target narrow, right? He can really make it a very narrow strip. That's why he, well, why he calls it target width because he's really concerned about the width of this little rectangle. Or he can widen it to be much wider and therefore easier to hit. 
So he tested various combinations of amplitudes and widths and a, you know, a big complex series of trials. And he's recording movement time for each of these uh, combinations of A over W, right? And what does he find? This is what he finds. Remember that's linear equation, right? So movement time is supposed to be a linear function of the index of difficulty. That's what's implied by the Fitts law equation on the couple of slides back. Well, here's a graph. Is it, is it a straight line? Yes, right? That's why this is called Fitts law, because this is a lawful relationship here between the index of difficulty on the x-axis, ranging from one to seven, and movement time on the y-axis is linearly constrained. And not, it's not only just a linear relationship, but when you fit a linear regression, you fit the best fitting line to this, one of the things that you're concerned with are how close are the points to the line. So not only are they falling on the line, showing it's a linear relationship, but they're really close to the line, meaning there's not a lot of variability. And you can see that the correlation coefficient here is extremely high. I mean, ridiculously high for psychology, 0.983. And of course, what you really do when you do a regression is you do R squared. So 0.98 squared, whatever that is, is still very high. And what that really means is that essentially what R squared tells you statistically is, is we usually refer to it as the proportion of variance accounted for in Y by X. So how much variation in movement time is accounted for by the index of difficulty? Over 90%. And so practically speaking, what we could say about this is that we have accounted for essentially all of the variability in movement time using the index of difficulty. There's nothing else meaningful that needs to be known to be able to predict the time it takes to complete a movement, except for the amount of, of information that the task requires in terms of bits as measured on the x-axis here. From this function, we could of course even calculate the bandwidth directly from, from the equation if we, if we do a little bit of math on it. And so 10.6 bits per second is, is the actual bandwidth limit. And that seems to be the one and only variable that needs to be known in order to predict this simple movement response here. So what we see here, as I had mentioned at the beginning, a very concrete example of how successful this kind of psychology could be, right? That we can start calculating information difficulty of a simple task and measure it in terms of bits, theorize that the system is a limited bandwidth system and design a task that pushes the system to its limits, and then show that its performance perfectly corresponds to the task difficulty. And you end up with Fitts law as a result of that classic law in psychology. We don't get very many laws in psychology, so the fact that this works is a pretty compelling demonstration and perhaps is a big reason why cognitive psychology is still a thing 70 some years later. Well, there we have it for cognitive psychology. So uh, that wraps up our history of experimental psychology, even though we still have some more to go in this class when we move into chapters 15 through 18, we'll be looking at the history of some more abnormal and clinical areas but stay tuned for that.